So this morning I was talking about ribs and the rib cage and the thorax and intercostal muscles and that sort of thing for a couple of hours. So I thought, how about we do a short video just on kind of one part of the ribs. We'll talk about the rib as a whole, but the, the costovertebral joint, so the vertebral end of the rib and how that moves and how that articulates, I think is particularly interesting. Um, so I thought, let's talk about the ribs as a whole, talk about some terms you may well come across, and then we'll talk about the shapes of the ribs, and talk about the joints of the ribs, um, and talk about the movements of the ribs. There's a video from a while ago with me when I'm cycling talking about the movements of breathing, so this is added to that. Yeah? Alright. So, the rib cage. Got to be quiet, because I'm, I'm actually in the prosection room, where we dissect have a human tissue. Um, usually I like to film with lots of nice natural light and we don't have any in here but hey it's winter as well so it's getting dark outside anyway. But the teaching in the other labs is oh, I shouldn't shout it'll be too loud. Mind you I can't hear them so they probably can't hear me. What do you know about the rib cage? What are the functions of the ribs? So when I ask people about what, what are the functions of the rib cage then people usually say um, well protection, uh, the ribs and the sternum protect the heart, protect the lungs and that sort of thing. And yes, they do have a role in protection. Um, and people also say, well, you know, you move so you can breathe, which is also true. But there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. So we've got the ribs and we've got the intercostal muscles in between. And what we want to do in the thorax in terms of breathing is we want to draw air in and push air out. And of course we do that with the movements of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a dome, but as it flattens, it increases the volume in the thorax. And as we move the ribs, we increase the volume in the thorax. So if we increase the volume, then air gets drawn in to equalise the pressure. But of course, with these movements, so with the movements of the diaphragm, if you're increasing the volume within the thorax, if you didn't have the ribs, if you didn't have a firm wall, a firm barrel, a firm container that would resist those changes in pressure, then if you pull the diaphragm down, as much as drawing air in, you'd also pull in the, the walls of this barrel, right? the walls of the thorax. If you didn't have any muscles here, the skin would get pulled in. And this is actually what we see in patients that have got spinal cord injuries in the neck, um, who have lost the innovation to the intercostal muscles. Soon after that, um, that injury, then these muscles do lose their natural tone. So while you're sat there, and you're breathing, probably with your diaphragm, because I imagine most of you aren't jogging while watching this video, you're probably sat down, you're not burning a lot of energy, you're not bringing a lot of gas in and out. So you're breathing with your diaphragm. And as you're breathing with your diaphragm and you're, you're, you're pulling that dome down and flattening it, um, you've got tone in the intercostal muscles in between the ribs. They are firm, there is firmness there because the muscles have a little bit of contraction. If you lose that tone, so after a spinal cord injury, if you lose that tone, then what we see is that when the person breathes in, the skin does get drawn in, in between the ribs, because there's no resistance to that change in pressure. And that makes everything less efficient. It still works, but it's less efficient, because as you move your diaphragm, you're not just drawing air in through the, through the, uh, the trachea and what have you, but you're also pulling against these muscles, and these muscles are deforming, so you're using some of that energy to deform the wall of the thorax. So the ribs and the muscles are important in resisting those changes of pressure to help breathing and make those movements of breathing more efficient. So we've got protection, we've got forming that pressure barrel, and also the ribs have got these things hanging off them. They're a support for the upper limb. You've got a load of muscles, and in the other video we talk about accessory muscles of respiration in that there are other muscles passing between the ribs and the upper limbs and the neck. And normally they're for doing other things, but if you fix the upper limbs, you can then use those muscles to move the ribs and move the rib cage. Um, so the ribs are also a support, are something to hang the upper limbs off. So that's what the rib cage does. Those are the functions of the ribs and the rib cage. Now what about the anatomy of the ribs? Are all the ribs the same? No. Um, most of them are very similar. Uh, and most of these ribs appear similar, and we call these the typical ribs. So ribs 2 to 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, look very similar. They have very similar shapes, and we'll look at some of the features in a moment. And those are the typical ribs. 
Now the first rib is quite different. Look. So the first rib is a lot flatter, a lot wider. This bit's quite different here. This bit where it comes from the vertebrae and it only articulates with one vertebra, whereas the other ribs articulate with two vertebrae. Um, so this is an atypical rib. The first rib is an atypical rib. And when you're looking at a chest x-ray, make sure you can find the first rib, because it looks weird, and that's where you should start counting from. The other two atypical ribs, then, are 11 and 12. And 11 and 12 are floating ribs. You see how all the other ribs, all the other ribs, pass from vertebrae around to the manubrium sternum. Manubrium sternum ziphoid process. So they pass around here, but ribs 11 and 12 are floating ribs. They pass into the, the abdominal wall musculature. They don't pass to the sternum. We have typical ribs and atypical ribs, and these two are floating ribs. These terms aren't terribly important but it's likely you'll come across them, so it's good to know what they mean. Um, and the other term that comes up are, are, are true ribs and false ribs. Now the true ribs are the ribs that pass from the vertebrae and pass to a um, cartilage and then to the manubrium or the sternum directly. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven gets included as well. These all have their own costal cartilages and they're the true ribs. The other ribs share those cartilages. So 8, 9, 10, ooh, hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So ribs 8, 9, 10, they share a cartilage to pass to the manubrium. So those are false ribs. While the costochondral joints are primary cartilaginous joints, meaning there isn't much movement at those joints, the costal cartilages as a whole do give some flexibility to the ribcage. The costovertebral joints are synovial joints, and they're interesting because there are a number of facets, there are a number of articulating surfaces. So let's have a look at that. Now, to look at these, I've got Thoracic vertebrae, so these are a little bit different to lumbar vertebrae, a little bit different to cervical vertebrae, um, but essentially it has the same parts. So we've got the vertebral body there, we've got the transverse processes, we've got the spinous process, and the lamina and the pedicles and what have you. Um, the interesting thing about the um, thoracic vertebrae is that the transverse processes have an articulating facet here. Guess what articulates there? It's a rib. But also, they have an articulating, well, like half an articulating facet really here and here on the body. These two big articulating facets here, there are these two here, and then there are these two underneath. You can imagine that these articulate with the the upper and lower vertebrae next to them, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are cervical vertebrae. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So those are the thoracic vertebrae. One, two, three, four, five, lumbar vertebrae. So can you see how how these facets here, these are the the facets of articulation between adjacent vertebrae and they move a little bit and all these little movements add up to big movements that's what the vertebrae look like what did the ribs look like so if we look at our skeleton here this is our plastic skeleton plastic bones are never as good as real bones um, but they are a lot more convenient can you see how all of these these ribs here kind of have a, a straight bit passing from the vertebrae to about here and then they start to curve antero-inferiorly. You see what I mean? So the rib starts across like this, it's descending a little bit in this case, and then from this point here, it's starting to descend anteriorly, inferiorly, and curve around. This is the angle of the rib. 
So if we, and you see the problem with plastic skeletons is I can't really take them apart very easily. So I've got some human bones. So this is a, a human rib. So we want to be careful with this. And this human rib lets us see a lot of the detail of the rib that we can't see on plastic bones. And a few things we'll notice is that this is the head of the rib, this is the neck of the rib, so this is the tubercle, do you see this lump here? And then, do you see that angle change I was talking about? A little bit? So that's the angle of the rib there. And we can see on the other side how there's a, a, a groove here, this costal groove, and in there we have a neurovascular bundle running, so we find the, the intercostal nerve, the intercostal artery, the intercostal vein run under here. Um, and they give off collateral branches which then run on on the upper edge, the superior edge of the the rib below. And it flattens anteriorly. But if we look if we look at the head of the rib, there are two articulating surfaces. There's one here and there's one here. And then there's a third articulating surface on the tubercle. And these are all synovial joints. They don't allow a lot of movement, but they are moving for most of your life. Uh, and they have synovial capsules. So how does this attach to this? I mentioned these two articulating facets here, these demi-facets. And we can place the rib like so. This articulating surface will articulate with the the, the inferior vertebra. Imagine the next thoracic vertebra superior to this will articulate with this articulating surface like this. Right? So the ribs are half a step out of phase with the vertebrae. The reason for that is that the vertebrae have actually formed half a step out of phase with everything else. We're segmented animals and these are formed from somites, like many other parts of our segment. So if you want to know about why that is, we need to talk about the embryology of somites, which we might do one day. Um, but the rib sits like this. So these two articulating surfaces go together. So the head of the rib to this demi-facet on the vertebral body. And this facet on the transverse process articulates with this articulating surface on the tubercle of the rib. In the cycling video I talked about how we use the intercostal muscles. There are three layers. The external intercostal muscles are most active during inspiration when they're elevating the ribs. And the internal intercostal muscles are most active when we're pulling the ribs down. But how do the ribs actually move? Do they, do they move like this? Well that would take them away from their articulating surface, right? They do a couple of things. A lot of the movement is just a rotation movement here. Can you see how we can rotate the rib a little bit, right? So we're rotating the rib a little bit. So certainly it's rotating along the head and neck of the rib, right? And what that's doing is as we rotate the rib, it's elevating the sternum. And this is the pump handle movement, isn't it? whereby the sternum is elevated, so the anteroposterior dimension of the thorax is increased and air is drawn in. This rotational movement about the neck of the rib and the head of the rib there causes a little movement here at the back posteriorly causes a much larger movement anteriorly. But we also know that the, lib the ribs lift upwards and outwards laterally, increasing the lateral dimension of the thorax and drawing air in. But then there's also a little bit of movement like that between these facets, just a small amount of movement which allows the ribs to, to elevate. These joints are held together by a number of ligaments, the costotransverse ligaments, there are a number of costotransverse ligaments, and joints themselves have joint capsules, so this is all fairly tough. In comparison then to this typical rib, here is here's an atypical rib, this is the first rib. You can see how it's a lot flatter, um, it only articulates with the T1 vertebra. It has a tubercle, so it still has a head, a neck and a tubercle. But the rib is, has a, a much sharper curvature, 
it, uh, it has the, the distance to the angle here is similar to the other ribs, but the remainder of the rib is very short. It's very, very flat. And in fact, we often find grooves. Oh yeah, there's a groove. We often find grooves on the first rib because we have the um, subclavian artery and vein passing over the top of it. Quite a big blood vessel, so they leave their mark on the, on the first rib. Now if we bring the skeleton back in, so that's those costa vertebral and costo transverse joints back here, that's how those work. Um, and we talked about the costo chondral joints here, cartilaginous joints that don't allow much movement. These sternocostal joints here are also synovial, synovial joints. The joint here between the first cartilage and the manubrium is also uh, primary cartilaginous joints, there's not a lot of movement here. But here, for the remaining uh, costal cartilages, where they meet the sternum, they are their plain um, synovial joints. And again, there's not a lot of movement there, but any movement that does occur is, is occurs freely because we have these nice synovial joints allowing movement. When so we can fracture ribs, but also we can damage the joints. Now these joints are held together by a whole load of ligaments. We've also got a lot of very deep muscles in the back, joining the vertebrae, also linking vertebrae to ribs and all sorts of. This is well protected and really tough. Injuries to joints in the ribs tend to happen here and here. So with, with blows to the chest, you can get dislocation of this joint and these pull apart. Um, and you can get these joints pulled apart as well. Which tends to be not a very good thing to do. So don't forget that we've got the intercostal muscles in between these guys. So we've got three layers of intercostal muscles. We've got an intercostal neurovascular bundle moving around here, the intercostal nerve, artery and vein. They give off collateral branches that then run, run superior to the inferior rib around here. So if you stick in needles or knives in people's chests to help them, to treat them, you know. You want to avoid those neurovascular bundles by, by sticking needles in the middle between ribs, avoiding the neurovascular bundles. The intercostal muscles move the ribs, but also we've got other muscles in the neck. So any muscle that you find that's attached to a rib is probably doing a different job. It's probably moving the upper limb, or it's probably moving the head or something. But if you find a muscle that's attached to the ribs, I think that's fair game to call that a muscle of an accessory muscle of respiration. So the muscles in the neck, they might move their head, but if you keep your head still, you can use sternocleidomastoid, you can use the scalenes, which come to the first two ribs to elevate the rib cage. You've got serratus anterior around here, which normally moves the scapula. Um, you've got pectoralis minor, which normally depresses the shoulder. But if you keep your shoulders fixed, you can use those muscles to lift the ribs. So those are the accessory muscles of respiration. But those are the movements of the ribs. So remember the pump handle movement and the bucket handle movement as the ribs are lifted up laterally. The purpose of those movements is to increase the volume in the thorax. The diaphragm also increases the volume in the thorax by flattening. If you increase the volume in the thorax, you decrease the pressure. If you decrease the pressure, then air wants to move in to equalize. And hopefully the only way that air can move in is through the mouth and the trachea and the airways to fill the lungs with air. And then the lungs are very elastic, so they like to, like to shrink and like to push air out if they can. But um, you can also use muscles to push air out. So when you're burning a lot of energy and you're pulling a lot of air and pushing out a lot of air, you can use muscles to pull air in and push air out. And of course, this is also important when you're talking to people and you want to push air out in a steady stream so you can make your vocal cords vibrate and make sound and also when you cough and sneeze and that sort of thing. So those are the ribs, those are the shapes of the ribs, the features of the ribs and the head of the ribs. All right, and don't forget that cycling video um, of me talking about breathing. That explains those other, those other things in a bit more detail.